podcasting with Kerry Jones. Hi guys, and welcome to this week's podcast. This week's episode is in association with Tourism Ireland and the Fly Fishing Journal. Well, I'm sitting here now, just to come back from my trip to Ireland, and I have withdrawal symptoms. I'm sitting here with a pint of Guinness in my hand. It wasn't as long as I expected, but I have some work I need to do. And uh, But anyway, I hope to be back now in July. Plan to fish more waters like uh, Loch Arrow, uh, Loch Con, Sheelin, Enel, and even down to Kerry to fish Karan. Some of these waters I will be going to on my next visit. So I stayed all my trip on Corrib, and I didn't leave because I was expecting it to come on any day, because it didn't really happen. Even though I had fished most days, it was a mixed bag really had to dig deep to get fish it was fly around the mayfly in some places was prolific but in the majority of places it was quite sparse and weak could be to do with the conditions because we had a lot of bright sun and big wind north wind and then the opposite then we had flat calms but like i said i had fish most days i think i think of any size on the fly probably up to two pound but after a while, I decided to do some trolling and my passion for the ferox. I had a couple, the biggest one topping 14 pound. So that put a smile on my face. I made my trip. But more about that fish later. So the first half of the trip, I concentrated solely on fly fishing or the mayfly feeding fish. And predominantly fishing dries. When it was years ago, the wets were the thing. I still occasionally fish the wets now. More and more people now are fishing dries and usually brings a lot more success. As soon as I got there, it was plain to see that the fly was patchy. Whoever you spoke to was saying different stories. But the majority of them were saying the fly hasn't happened yet. So it was time to actually do some searching and go to the usual areas where in the past I found and caught fish. Because Cory was so big... It's quite an enjoyable thing to do. You're searching more water. You're hunting for the fly. You know, you're looking for fish. And there's lots of signs which you look for. One of these signs is looking for the gulls and the terns feeding and looking for mayfly themselves. And this we saw an awful lot. But the one thing which was quite clear early on, the gulls were looking for the fly as well as us. Because we can see them hovering around, searching around, swooping from area to area, looking. There wasn't a great deal actually coming onto the water to take fly. So they must have been as frustrated as me. And in the past, when things have been tough, I have always found that drifting onto the points of the islands, out from the open water and the big bays, you usually pull a few fish. And that gives you more confidence. The fish tend to be more often or slightly smaller. But... When it's hard, one thing you need to get confidence in your flies. So this I did. And for the first few days, I didn't have any fish. Half-hearted takes out in the open bays like in Port Caron. But as soon as I decided to go near the islands and drift onto the points and off the points, I was getting fish. But not many. On average, just one or two a day. Good fish, man. From about pound and a half to just under two. Now my base is Port Karen, because I have my boats and my Basel Shields. Great location, but at the end of the day, we meet up with the other anglers heading out from there, and almost everyone had the same story to say. But the difference was, everyone was talking about buzzers. Now, April time is renowned for the buzzer fishing, or the duck fly, but it also goes into May now. And it, it's a bit strange because there was there's anglers, a groups of Welsh anglers, there's about two large groups of guys who've been going out for many, many years to fish the mayfly. But now they go in earlier to fish for the buzzers. It, it's not surprising really, 
because these fish really do grow big on feeding buzzers, especially the camptor buzzers, which are large duck fly. But for me, when I go to Ireland in May, it's the May flight I'm interested in. But one thing for sure, a lot of these fish that the, the guys were having were bigger fish and they were caught further down the lake while fishing buzzers from Birchall all the way down to way past Knock Ferry. It's a bit of a journey. But a lot of these fish, I wouldn't say averaging, but they were getting regular fish four or five pound. But not the numbers. Yes, April fished well. But now in May, I think the buzzer was tailing off. So everyone by now was starting to struggle. Now when I fish dries, I'll just fish two. And there's two flies which I have got total 100% confidence in. There's no need for me to chop and change. If the fish are up, they will take them. It's not to do with the, uh, the pattern they don't like. And the two flies which I've used with great success in the past on this trip was Jimmy Turrell's Detached Dry Mayfly and Basil Shield's CDC Mayfly. Now these two fish together, for me, is as good as anything. Both these flies took all my fish. It was hard. I was getting averaging two fish a, d- a day, you can say. But again, they were only on the islands. On two occasions, we went in for lunch. And you could see the wind coming off the island and out to the side. And they were splash, splash, splash. So the fish were consistently staying in. Whether or not it was because of the cold wind, they weren't out in the open water, I don't know or whether or not the, they stayed close to the islands to get the, the free offerings of the mayfly being blown off. But on two occasions, like I said, while having lunch, I grabbed my rod, covered a couple, and I took two good fish up to two pound, which is nice sport on the dry fishing from the shore. Not quite as big as the one I had a few years ago, which I was doing exactly this, and I had one just over seven pound. It's not something you'd expect off the shore. Well, as years ago, I used to fish every single day from morning till night. It's nice now to take a few days off. I was then joined by my girlfriend. She came over to fly over Flint to Dublin. I picked her up, so she spent some time with me for a couple of days, which is good to actually reset because fishing every day, doing the same thing, looking, searching for for fish, and it wasn't happening. It can be quite tough on the mind as well, you know. Getting up each day thinking, is it going to be the same? So I took a few days off. One day, actually, I did go over to meet Ted Werry and had a few hours with him over in Ballinalty Bay and did a podcast. So if you haven't heard that, that's the last episode. And also met up with another professional fly tire, Jimmy Turrell. I spent a day with him. But what I did to, to the reset, you can stay, we went to Linan. Westport and Galway just to take time out and take it easy Westport is quite the place we're a little bit off the fishing talk now if you haven't been to Westport you have to go there are numerous bars there and one of my favourites is the most popular one at all probably is Matt Malloy's music there is seven nights a week so it was nice to just chill out have a few beers because I got the camper van now it was great it's nice to go to these places have a few beers, and just put your head down in the van. I also met up with Colin Follan, which again, I've had podcasts with in the past. And I drove down to Galway to meet him. We started off in Salt Hill, which is a lovely part of Galway, and then into the city centre. We were only meant to have a coffee, but if you know Colin Follan, no one ever has a coffee. So that was a time to remember. So, feeling fresh now after a couple of days off, I went out with Gloria. Initially, to troll, just to see if we can get something big. And then one of the islands, when we were trolling, we had quite a big wind, actually, a north wind. And then coming past the front in the lee of the island, I could see a few fish showing. But I had a, I looked then at the, at the bow of the boat, and I did have my fly rod with me, packed away. But then as you're trolling slowly around the front, could see so much fly coming off. They were both the duns and the spent. This was around about six o'clock in the evening. So I just watched and watched as a motor had passed. And there were some amazing big fish rising there. So he thought, right, 
let's give it a go. So I pulled the trolling rods in and just motored quietly into the lee of the islands and waited and watched. And these fish were still feeding. There was a wind coming round the point and on the edge and the seam you could see where the rough water goes into calm. You could see one or two fish consistently rising and these were big fish. There are some uh, big fish areas you can see. One of my favourite places where you can catch good trout. Steep water, relatively close in. These big fish aren't far from the islands. So we waited. So I set up the rod, put the two dries up and waited. And then there was another good fish. I covered him and he came up three times. I covered him each time and he actually swirled and I thought you took the flight the third time. I lifted nothing. He's getting quietly excited now. And things, we waited there probably about half hour. And things started to go slack. But I just cast the line out. And give the rod to Gloria now. Try to explain to her how to cast and to keep the line tight. And as I did that, would you believe it? Fish took. She lifted the rod. And you can imagine it was pandemonium. That's the first time she held a fly rod. So we did manage to get this fish in after a, quite a, a funny battle and uh, brought to the net and to my amazement it was a beautiful fish I, I would say it would have been around about six pound but one thing I did notice it wasn't your usual fly feeding fish you know the smaller heads and the fatter body this to me seemed like it was a ferox he had the typical ferox head slightly lean body so it made me think these fish that should out in the deep I think this was a young ferox these fish would have been out in the deep and when there's enough fly they just come in whether or not they're inquisitive or they just want to see they can see a lot of other fish coming feeding on the fly this is a possibility smaller fish feeding congregating so they're coming in to see I don't know but uh, for some reason, these ferox have been known to come into the islands in the shallow water at Mayfly time. Some of these fish which are moving were the five, six pound plus fish, maybe bigger, which is exciting to see. So this fish, I think, was either an opportunist or he just thought that, you know, there were fly coming up enough to feed. But that was a special time for me. Gloria's first fish playing the fish so she's hooked now anyway there's more gear to buy now um, so after a few photographs we slipped her back I told her we'll see her another time when she's a little bit bigger so that was an unexpected fish after fishing hard for two weeks again around the islands though that was the key thing now after having this fish the following day was another one of those blistering hot days again flat calm bright sun and this is what we had for the rest of the trip. And because the fishing has been slow as it was, we decided then to concentrate our fishing on the evening. Because evening fishing while trawling can be really, really successful. Um, and what you find is a lot of people are out in the day trawling the calm because they think the only thing to do in a calm day is to troll. But to be honest, I haven't found, I don't think I've had much success at all trawling in a flat calm. So I try to, when it is a calm day and nothing really is happening, you know, the buzzer boys won't even have many fish then. And I was just tired of fishing the dries now after two weeks. So I decided the following evenings to concentrate trolling again once more, try and get that special fish. And after two weeks, I knew I had to dig in deep. And if I was going to catch a good ferox, I had to make sure that every knot was perfect because I've had my heart broken a couple of times in the past where you you make you mount up and then in a little bit of a hurry and then it'll come back to bite you then because these fish these big fish if there's any weakness anywhere in your tackle anywhere in your your knots your methods they'll find the hole so it all has to be right now on this one evening we didn't go out till about five o'clock we 
had some food on the island, which is something which I love. And it sets you up then for the last few hours. And before just pushing the boat out and heading back out, I checked, double-checked. I must have talking about the best part of half hour, setting up my two mounts ready for if a fish was going to take, it was going to stick. And the evening just felt right. I spoke about this before. It, it just felt like the, now there wasn't too much of a wind. There was a good ripple. And the sun was going down early evening. And I just felt it in me that something was going to happen. And I actually, when I was setting up the mounts, I did something which I haven't done for about, about 10 years plus. There was, I'm not going to give the secret away because I, I'm onto something now. But there was a certain method while tying the rope, while putting the roach onto the mount, which I totally forgot about. But obviously, it does make a difference. So anyway, full, full of confidence now, I headed out. And as we were going out, my excitement was drawing on as the sun was going slightly lower. My expectations was high. This particular evening, fishing from another boat. And the reason for this is, is because the area I was fishing was way up the lake. A little bit too far for me to motor from Basel's, just for a few hours. A good friend and patron, Andy Barton, lent me his boat. So I kindly took up the offer. The one difference is, we didn't have any rod dress to put the trolling rods. So, but that's no problem. I held one rod while I was on the engine, and Gloria was on the bow holding the other rod. So we decided around a couple of areas which I know usually produces fish for me. And I'm slowly coming around one of these islands, watching the tip of my rod. And then all of a sudden, that feeling you get when you know there's a fish tap in it. It was tap, 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 tap. I'm just waiting now. I give a little bit of a short burst. Next thing, I heard Gloria just shout, Fish! <laughs> now, I, I just thought, yes, there is. Because I thought she was looking at my rod and thinking there's a fish on mine. The next thing, I looked at her and her arms were outstretched. And she just handed the rod to me. And the reel was screaming. I took the rod off her. I held it high. And I could feel the weight of a really good fish on the end. This is when the excitement begins then. Anyway, this fish just kept going. Kept going. Come near the boat. And it kept going again. And back and forth. And after a lengthy battle now, it was just under the boat. These ferrocks got a... I don't know what it is. They love to go under the boat. And then so to... What I, used to, what I do then is to actually stand in the middle of the boat waiting to see which, which way it's going to go because they just go under and then they'll run under. So then you've got to go to whichever end it's near to to put the rod in the water, not for it to get snagged under the boat, under the keel. So anyway, after a while, we waited and waited. Just give it enough line. If it needs line, just give it line. There's no point rushing the fight at this stage now. If our fish wants to go, you give it line. You waited days to get the fish like this on. Enjoy the fight. And I normally set the drag quite slack because if it's tight, when they run, these fish got a tendency to, when they run, they run down, not out. So there's more, so if they buy the boat and they just run down quickly, that short, sharp change of angle down, the rod goes down. If you get a tight drag, it's going to be end of play. So I much prefer to have it on the slack side, the drag, and use it, just finger touch, like you would with a, the fly reel, and just hold it and play it, just with the tension of your finger. Anyway, after a while, the fish came to the net, and what a fish it was. So those of you who are looking online now, you'll see the fish. After a quick couple of photographs and the release video, she went back. And that made my day. That brought a big smile on my face. It's been a tough couple of weeks. And to get that fish finally in the boat, you can imagine how I felt. We estimated it 
at around between 13 and 14 pounds, a safe 13. I didn't weigh it, unless it's a high teen now, the 17 or thereabouts. I wouldn't weigh it, I just estimate it. So like I said, I would say around about the 14. What a colourful, beautiful fish. And in the light in the evening then, it was glistening in the sun. What a sight to see. One thing I point out as well, when these fish, I've noticed this a lot now, when you have a three, four pound fish even, you're releasing it. As soon as the power's in the tail, she kicks and goes almost like a 45 degrees down. But with these ferox, this happened far too many times to be a coincidence now. As they kick, ready to go, they just go straight down, almost vertical. So it goes to show that they are a deep fish. That's where they live, and that's where they feel safe. And finally, on the last evening, myself and Gloria fly fished for the last hour or so. We went out about five o'clock, fished around Malachy's. Didn't see a great deal happening, but it was nice to be out to fish along the island, and the sun was going down. But it was something we wanted to do. We wanted to have a, a nice meal to finish off the trip. So we, something which I love is to make a fire, a couple of pans, get some good food going, boil a kettle, and take in the surroundings. And by the way, the food is gorgeous. After taking a few photographs, and I've, I've done a little video of us cooking actually beside the lake, which I'll be putting up shortly. There was an incredible sedge hatch. And it was too good to miss a photography opportunity. And this again, I will put up. There was probably more sedge on that evening than I've ever seen. It was incredible. And to be honest, with all the fly that was around, there wasn't a great deal of fish rising. There there were some fish. There must have been about, I think we saw about four, maybe five fish during the time we were there. Just rise out again at the seam, at the edge between the calm water and the breeze coming around the corner. But the, as I said, the photography opportunity was something else. Had the boat on the shore, the sun was going down, you got the Connemara Hills behind the Mount Gable, and all these sedges around. It really was something special. One of my favourite pictures of all time. So make sure you keep an eye out for that picture. I will put it up very shortly. All these photographs and all these flies and speaking about and the photography to go with this podcast is available on my patreon all access one thing as well i want to mention it was great to meet up with a few of my patrons some i get the opportunity to fish with and others and meet up for lunch on the island or just tell stories over the pint while i was there that's danny cullen stephen o'neill dermot walsh nigel hartley ted Wherry. Gareth Dorr, Andy Barton, and Peter Boyle. And Peter, actually, you'll see in the next issue of the Fly Fishing Journal, will he be writing about sedge fishing on the Western Lochs. And regarding the Fly Fishing Journal, if you haven't seen this issue which is out now, make sure you get a copy. Or you'll see my angle and a twist on why I love the Corrib so much. And also those of you who like Loch Arrow, there's a feature there also by Jackie Mann. Well, time now for another pint of Guinness, I think. I look forward to my next trip. If you've enjoyed this podcast and want to listen to more, please consider becoming a patron. We will get weekly podcasts and access to over 125 episodes, behind-the-scenes photography to go with each episode, plus other exclusive content and prizes. To become a patron, visit patreon.com forward slash casting with kerry jones or you can find the link on my website casting with kerry that's all for now tight lines and don't strike too soon <laughs>